uh, classification and discrete choice models. Actually, uh, I think I'll probably need two more classes to finish this. Uh, so let's continue from last time where we uh, left off, okay? So we discussed uh, multinomial, uh, multi-class classification last time. For multi uh, e to the beta x, okay, 1 plus e to the beta x, that's the binary case. For multinomial, we're going to assume For multinomial, we're going to have a different beta j for each j, right? So for each different uh, choice, I'm going to have a different beta j. So beta j prime x, and then e to the beta j prime x. Now, it's basically this, okay? So for binary, we're going to assume this is proportional. We can, we can think about the property as proportional to this. Now, in reality, it is equal to this e to the beta j prime x divided by the sum of all, right? So the sum of all e to the beta k prime x, k goes from 1 to uh, j. Okay, so suppose we have j choices. It's like that. Right? So we add all the these together, so everybody is between 0 and 1. The goal of doing this, the reason why we're doing this is exactly the same as the reason why we're doing uh, the, in the binary case, we're doing the sigmoid, because we're, well, we want to turn this term, which is unbounded, into between 0 and 1, and we want to make sure that all the properties add up to 1. Now there's only one thing we one one thing further we need to add, which is we should always normalize. We should always take one level as a reference level, uh, and normalize that. By normalize that, we make that beta j equal to zero. So suppose we say level one is used as a reference, then that means beta one will be equal to zero. Now in that case, uh, we can write. One, right, because e to the zero is one. So one is always going to be the reference level plus the sum of the same thing, right, e to the beta k prime x. But now we can say, okay, k goes from two to uh, the big J because we're setting level one as the reference level, right? So we always set one level as a reference. And uh, okay, so that's our model. Now the implication of the multi-class logistic regression model is that the log, we can always write the log probability of y equal to j condition x divided by probability of y equal to k. So these are two different levels. This is always going to be equal to beta j, right, minus beta k prime x, right? It's always going to be equal to, to this. So if, uh, right, okay, we always have this relationship for multi-class logistic regression model. From that, of course, I can also write, what is, uh, so what is beta j, what is beta j prime x? Uh, beta j prime x would just be the log of probability of y equal to j divided by, divided by what? What is the thing, what should I divide by here in order to just basically have beta j prime x here. Y equal to the reference level, okay? So one here, suppose one is the reference level, then this is always going to be beta j prime x because for the reference level, I'm going to set beta always equal to zero for that, for that level, okay? So beta j x for each level beta j x is, once you, now this beta j is your, you know, we can see this directly from estimation results, right? So this, when you look at the estimation results, you'd always understand the beta j as indicating the relative probability of choosing the j relative to the reference level. Right, so that's the understanding you have. Uh, in the example we have last time, we estimated a simple choice model where people are choosing transportation mode by car, by subway, uh, by bus. Then uh, from the results, we see that the bus is chosen at a reference level. So we have estimate for car and subway. Now for the subway level, we see the intercept is minus eight. Uh, income is 0.7, and distance is 3.7. So this is the beta j for subway. And the way to understand this is this 0 0.7 means if you take the subway, you are more likely to, uh, sorry, if you're high income, if your income is higher, then you are more likely to choose subway relative to bus, okay, relative to the reference level. Because this beta x 
is indicating the relative probability of choosing J versus choosing one, right? versus choosing the reference level, say. The other thing uh, that uh, immediately you should see from this model is this is the so-called decision boundary. So this is the boundary that separates uh, level uh, class J from class K. Okay? When this is equal to zero, then this is equal to one, right? So the probability, the probability is equal to one, meaning the probability is, is about the same. So this is the boundary that separates two class. If it's above zero, then the probability of y equal to j is higher than probability of y equal to k. If it's below zero, the probability of y equal to k is higher. So this is the boundary, and the boundary is, is what? It's a linear line, right, in x. So decision boundary is linear in logistic regression models. Whether we're talking about binary or multi-class, it's always a linear line that separates them, right? For the uh, transportation, we have, you know, we have this case, okay? So we have three lines that are separating the three different classes. Uh, we have a subway versus car, bus versus car, uh, bus versus subway. And in the end, our classification decision is based on the, uh, you know, the, the, these three decision lines, decision boundaries. So we end up having this kind of prediction. Right? We predict everything here to be subway, all these things to be bus, all these to be car, because these three decision boundaries can separate them. Okay. Now, one problem with um, the, uh, this uh, logistic regression, at least when it applies to this problem, okay? when it, at least when it applies to transportation mode problem, is the IA problem, is in the sense that when we do counterfactual predictions, if you want to say, okay, so let's take away the subway. If you take away the subway choice and you want to predict how people choose as a result, we end up, with, we end up getting this kind of prediction. We end up predicting everybody here to be car and everybody here to be bus because our decision boundary is separating the bus and a car remains the same, right? So if you take away the subway, the decision boundary remains the same, so we predict everybody here to be car and here to be bus. But that's, but that's problematic, okay? uh, Because you would expect that in reality, common sense will tell you, at least our understanding about this problem, will tell you that if you take away the subway, probably the majority of people will go to bus rather than go to car. Because subway and bus are both public transportation, Typically, people who take one form of public transportation is more likely to take another form of public transportation, right? So if you take the subway, you know, these people, in reality, you would expect that most of them will actually go to bus rather than go to car. So our logistic regression, in this case, running into a problem that, uh, that, that gives us, give us some unrealistic uh, counterfactual predictions. And that problem is called the IIA problem. In relevance of, uh, in the, uh, <laughs> I have, to, I have to take a look at the independence of irrelevant alternatives. Okay, so, there's, so it's, a, it's a really long name. Right. The IA problem, uh, what's, the fundam what's the root of this IA problem? I give you another example last week, uh, last week right? The red bus, blue bus, classic example. So originally we only have one blue bus and another car, uh, and a, uh, yeah, blue bus or car, <laughs> running around the road, right? You can either take the blue bus or you take the car. If you if, if you introduce a new red bus, you would expect that the people who take car do not change. The people who take the bus will you know, alternately take in blue or red. So the blue bus market share will be spread evenly between blue bus and a red bus once we have, a, we have a red bus, but the market share for car should not change. But using logistic regression, it changes, right? Using logistic regression, in the end, uh, the, uh, the, it, you know, if once we have a red bus, <coughs> then the percentage of people who take car will go down to 40%. Originally, it's 60%, okay? So, uh, so the, the model gave us a prediction that, that almost 20% of the population will switch from car to red bus once we introduce a red bus. That's clearly unreasonable. Right. The root problem here is because there are some unobserved variables that should tell us that, look, the people who people treat blue bus and the red bus almost the same. But the car is fundamentally different. So blue bus and red bus are treated as substitutes, and a car is treated as something that's very different. And that kind of variable is missing from our model, right? So let's take a look at, uh, let's first uh, go back to this formula, okay? Now, this is the logistic regression formula, right? We know from the logistic regression model that the probability, cho probability choosing J versus probability choosing K only depend on X, and a beta j beta k. It doesn't depend on any other, anything else. 
right? So, so, let, so let this j be brute bus, let this k be car. And then suppose there is a subway, right? The probability of choosing car versus bus does not depend on subway. So whether there is a subway or whether, whether there's no subway, we always have the same decision boundary, right? However, and that's the problem with, uh, that's, the re that's the reason why we have the IA problem. Because now let's suppose, all right? Suppose there is an unobserved variable z. So this z is a variable you do not see. Uh, for example, okay, suppose z uh, is a preference for public transportation. People vary in their preference for public transportation. Some people like pr pr public transportation, some people like cars, uh, some people do not have driver license, so they cannot even drive anyway, right? So these are variables that we do not see in our data. Because in our data, we only have, like x is only income and distance, right? So once we have a z, now suppose this is the true model, okay? Suppose people make a decision based on this true model where they, they make decision based both on x and z. What happens when uh, we do not observe z? If z is missing, if we only calculate the probability of y conditional on x only without condition on z, then the probability of y conditional on x is essentially an integral of this true probability with respect to z, right? So we're essentially integrating this probability with respect to z, and once we do that, we get a probability of y conditional x. But look at this integral, right? After you do this integral, is the probability of y equal to j conditional on, look, it's, it depends both on beta j, gamma j, but if you integrate it, it's not going to, this part is not going to, going to be the same for everybody. So in other words, once we do this in integration, we no longer, the, the relative probability is no longer a simple function that only involves beta j bracket. It actually involves all the different choices, all the other different choices for z, because we are integrating over z for all different choices, okay? All right. now, there's no closed form for that, but if the point is, once you integrate it, then this probability, log p y equal to j versus log, p, uh, log, log, uh, log probability y equal to k, is no longer a function of x prime beta j and x prime beta k only. So, meaning that the probability choosing one versus probability choosing other now depends on other choices. No longer depends only on these two choices. So the probability of choosing car versus, sub, uh, car versus bus no longer only depends on beta car and beta bus. It depends on whether there's a subway and what the beta for subway is. Once we have a missing variable, Okay, because essentially you can think about it as we're integrating over an observed variable. So the problem with IA, you can think about the problem where there is essentially a unobserved variable. So that's one thing to think of. That's one way to imagine that. The other way to think about it is what happens when you have an observed variable like, like a Z, is that the Z variable makes different choices correlated more than other choices. So if the Z is a public preference for public transportation, then the existence of the Z and the fact that it explains people's choice means that bus and the subway are more correlated, right? Because they are both explained by Z, the preference for public transportation. On the other hand, car is different, right? Because car is not public transportation, so it's going to have a different coefficient with respect to Z. So the existence of an observable like Z makes some choices more correlated than the other, than the other choices, conditional X. And this difference in how closely uh, different choices are correlated is the root problem of IA. You can think about that, right? So let's again, in the example of the, of the transportation problem, you can say that the bus and the subway are more correlated with each other because they're both public transportation and they can be explained by things like Z uh, than the car, right? In this case, uh, the blue bus, red bus case, the blue bus and the red bus are almost perfectly correlated. They are, they're exactly the same thing. They are perfect substitutes. So, right? so in that case, the, if you use logistic regression to model that, then we have the problem of IA, independence of irrelevant alternatives. Now, the IA may not be a problem if you only want to do in-sample prediction. Right? But the IA will be a problem if you ever want to do counterfactual uh, prediction where you want to take away one choice or put in another choice because then you are essentially introducing new choices that will, that, that, you know, in order to make the correct prediction of those things, you need a correct understanding about the, how different choices are correlated. 
and a substitute for each other. In that case, the logistic regression will run into a problem. So we will, we will, uh, in this course, I will talk about how to, basically how to deal with that, right? Not immediately, but we will talk about how to do, how to deal with IA. Okay, now on to the next topic, right? So I just introduced, uh, oh, by the way, just one more thing before we go. Um, In binary classification, logistic regression is this model, right? The probability of y equal to 1 is sigmoid beta prime x. OK, uh, in, the case, in this case, y is a 0, 1 uh, variable. Now, I said this, in binary case, this uh, logistic regression can also be used in cases y is, is not a 0, 1 variable. But y is a sum, right? Y is a sum of 0, 1, sum of binary, right? OK? So let me just write it out. Now, for example, so, you know, think about the six animal case. So we have a group of animals, and each animal is likely to die or not. So y here is the sum of total animals survived. You can think about this y, the total survival, as the sum of each individual of n zero one one variable. For each individual, right, we have many, many animals. Okay? So for n animals, for each animal, it's a zero one, die or not die die or not die. And then if you add all of them together, then we have the y. Y is the total number of people who survive, right? Okay, so that in that case, y, we can also use logistic regression to model it. And in that case, y is a binomial distribution with n and t, right? n is the number of total number of individuals, and this p is our model where P is equal to sigmoid beta prime x. Right? So that's the multi. That's a sort of the logistic regression applied to a target variable, which, which is basically the sum of individual zero ones. It's the same thing in multi-class. In multi-class, y is typically one, two, three, etc. Okay. So let's say one, two, three. Now I can apply multi-class logistic regression to one, two, three. This kind of variable. I can also apply it to this case, okay? To a case where, um, suppose there are n individuals, again, and there are three choices, one, two, three, right? Now in the end, I know that y1, y1, you know, suppose n is 100, I know that 20 people choose choice one. So y1 is equal to 20. y2 is the total amount of people who choose choice two. Suppose like 30, okay? And y3 is 50, right? The total number of people. So I so now y is y is this variable, y is uh, 20, 30, 50, right? So out of 100 people, this amount of choose choose this amount of people choose choice one, this amount choose choice two, this amount choose choice three. The distribution of this y, okay, in, now what I can also use if I want to predict this y, okay, I can use the multi-class logistic regression. Just like I can use this in the in a simple binary case, I can use logistic regression for this case. In this case, do you know? Do people know the distribution of y? Do you know what distribution that is? So in binary, it's binomial. Do people know what the distribution like this is? The target variable. What is that? Now again, you know, here I have many, many individuals, right? N individuals. For each, for each individual, let me use uh, di, right? So d1, d2, d3. Di is one, two, three, okay? Only three choices, right? And I can say y1 will be equal to the sum of whether, whether di equal to one. Right? Okay, so this is y1. And the sum goes one from one to n. And similarly, y2 is the sum of di equal to two. Right. So this is our y. Our y is the sum of individuals who choose choice one, choice two, choice three. And to model y, I can use logistic regression. Multi, I, I can use logistic regression and multi-class, but the distribution now is called, a, instead of multinomial, uh, sorry, instead of binomial, I already set it up. Instead of binomial, the distribution now is called a multinomial, okay? 
Mao Tai no meal distribution. So if you know if you are unfamiliar with Mao Tai no meal distribution, uh, you know refresh your probability check take your check probability textbook and you know refresh it right. The Mao Tai no meal distribution again has two parameters. Mm -hmm. Just like a binomial. Okay, so it's also n and a p, right? And the n is how many people, right? Okay, and what is this p? Sorry, p is equal to what? What? Okay, no, no, no. It's, you can you can say. P is a vector. Yes, p is a vector. There's a p one, p two, p three. Yeah, right. But uh, how do we model this p? So what is a uh, what is P1? Let's say, let's say there's, a, there's you know, one, two, three, right? Uh, but let's say PJ, okay? PJ means the probability of choice J, okay? What is, what is PJ? How do we model PJ? What is the model for PJ using logistic regression? Great, okay, very good. I, I hear you say, well, it's not sigmoid because sigmoid is in binary. Soft max, right? But it's the same thing, okay? You all, you all understand the same thing. It's basically a soft, soft max function of, again, beta prime x. But if you write it out, want to write it out. So I use the same thing for soft max. Right? We, we use the same you know, notation for soft max. Okay? It's called a sigmoid or soft max or whatever, right? But if you want to write it out, then it's e to the beta j x, right? Because we're talking about probability j, divided by the sum of everything, okay? The sum of e to the beta k prime x, k goes from 1 to k. That's it. With one of them being 0, we being 1 actually, right? e to the 0, because one of them is the reference level. Okay, so that's it. Now, if we have this kind of model, by the way, if, so if y is the sum of individual choices, then y, and, 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 the, and if the individuals are all independent, are iid with the same probability of making each choice, then y is always going to be a multinomial distribution. Okay, so, so that has nothing to do with logistic regression or whatever. What makes this a logistic regression is this, what? is this thing, is that we assume the probability is the soft max function. Now once we do that, that that's called a logistic regression. If we assume this probability is some other kind of things, then that leads to, that, that gives us some other kind of models. Okay, so this is where logistic regression coming, and we can use logistic regression to model this problem. Now uh, this is this kind of problem is everywhere in economics, okay? The the how, what, how many people choose this option? How many people choose that option? If you wanna, if I wanna model, let's say the demand for cars, okay? So I wanna I wanna do the demand for for the for the car market. Uh, many people have written papers on that. Uh, I wanna know how many people would, would buy Honda uh, versus you know uh, versus Toyota, right? What are, how do people choose among different brands? This is a typical problem, right? People have a different, in each individual has a probability of choosing Honda versus Toyota, right? or versus some other kind of brand of cars. And then, the, and then the amount of people who end up purchasing, so the sales of Honda versus the sales of Toyota, right? the total amount being sold every year, you can think about that as the Y here, right? Because the Y is the total amount of people in the market who end up purchasing Honda. And the, uh, and the total amount of people who end up purchasing uh, uh, Toyota, right? So this one, two, three, y one will be the sales, will be the Q of people who buy Honda. This Q will be Q of people who buy Toyota, right? Uh, will be Q of people who buy BMW or something, right? So there are different choices, and you see in the data you see how many people buy these things. And if you want to model that, you can use a logistic regression model, where essentially you see y is a multinomial of n, n will be the amount of people in the market, potential buyers. So of course you don't know how many people will buy a car in, in any given year, but you know sometimes often what people do is they just put the population and into into this into this thing, right? If you want to you know analyze the Shanghai market, or whatever the market in the city, people just oftentimes just put a population and then they estimate people's probability using this logistic regression of uh, model, and then and then they estimate what's the people's probability of choosing Honda versus choosing uh, Toyota, etc. Okay, uh, using this logistic regression model. So that's often done. Uh, again, one problem with this approach is that you have to be careful about the, the different choices. If the, if the choices vary in terms of, you know, if, the, if some choices are very close to each other, if other choices are not very close to each other, right? some, cho some close choices are more substitutes 
some choices and more complements they're different then we have the IA problem and that can be a problem if you're ever you ever if you ever want to do kind of factual uh, predictions in the example I just gave you if you want to analyze the market share okay, if your goal is to analyze the amount or market share of Honda versus Toyota versus BMW then you should be clear you should be careful because Honda and Toyota Civic are closer substitutes than BMW right BMW is a little different so in that case you may have the IA problem right okay now, at least here, I don't, in my example, I don't have an IA problem. Here, I'm analyzing corn, wheat, and rice. Right? Again, just like you know, what I did before, in binary case, we talk about farmers' uh, cropping decision. Here, in that case, the, uh, uh, the decision is, is binary, whether they grow crops or whether they do not grow crops. And if we look at all the counties, and each county, uh, some land is cultivated, some land is not cultivated. So I want to understand, in the binary case, I want to understand how does temperature influence people's decision uh, to grow or not grow, right? So to grow or not to grow, that's the, that's the question, right? So, uh, so that's a binary. But for multinomial, let's see, okay? So now I want to predict not only whether farmer grow, grow crops or not grow crops, I want to predict whether farmer, which crop do farmer grow. The model I want to have is how does temperature and the rainfall, right? So we have two variables, temperature and rainfall. I want to see how these two variables influence uh, the cropping decision and they influence the uh, corn production, wheat production, and the rice production, okay? So this is our data, right? We, uh, we have different counties. In each county, this is the temperature, this is the rainfall, this is the amount of land available in that county, and, uh, and this is the amount of acres where corn is grown, this is the amount of acres wheat is grown, this is the amount of acres rice is grown, uh, and also there are some acres that are just empty, okay? Some fields are just empty, this is non crop. So altogether, we have four different possibilities. Not growing anything, growing corn, growing wheat, growing rice. So here we have four different class, okay? So four class, multi-class, longitudinal regression. So that's what we're going to do, all right? Okay. All right, so uh, some basic uh, pattern of data. You can see that uh, distribution of percentage cultivated, all right, actually, you know, this is more interesting probably. So this tells us how does the production of each uh, vary with temperature. Uh, as temperature increase, people grow more. As, as, the, as the temperature, you know, if in hotter areas, people try to grow more rice and the less wheat, for example. Uh, corn is not obvious. And, uh, and if rainfall, you know, if there's more rainfall, then people are more likely to grow rice, et cetera, right? So, so there's a pattern in agricultural production. So. We're going to do our multinomial logistic regression. Uh, it's very simple. In R, you just use a, it's called a multinom, uh, multinomial logistic regression, crop as a function of temperature and rainfall. And here are the estimates, right? From the estimate, the first thing you should see is, okay, which one is being used as a reference level? Again, you have four class, one class has to be referenced. The, typically, you are allowed to specify which level you want to be referenced. But if you do not specify, typically, the program will often, most programs will take uh, the first option as reference. So you can see here, right? Corn, wheat, rice. Which one has, which one has disappeared? The non crop, okay? The not growing option. So the non crop is being used as reference, okay? Um, how do you interpret these things? Well, you can say, look, the temperature here says negative uh, 0.525. That means when the temperature increases, you are more likely to not grow than grow wheat. So it's always relative to non-crop. Um, you know, here it says if rainfall increase, then you are more likely to grow corn relative to not growing at all. Okay, so always relative to the non-crop option. All right, and that's it, right? So that's uh, that's our logical regression fit. Uh, the relation between right, these are data points, and this surface is our logical regression fit. In this case, it looks. Looks, you know, looks a level of fit is pretty good. Right. Okay, so we have talked about binary logic regression and a multi-class or multi-monomial logic regression. Uh, these are traditionally statistical models that uh, that you know there's no economic meaning to it. Right. So statistician use them. Everybody, every applied statisticians use these kind of models. There's no economic meaning. Uh, in my introduction, I already said that uh, there is a 
you know, we, there is a approach called a structural estimation in economics where we fit economic theory to the data, right? Uh, so the model we fit has economic meaning. It's not just a statistical model. Uh, now I'm going to basically introduce the first kind of these models that has economic meaning. And this one is extremely simple. It's almost a statistical model, right? But it has some basic economic interpretation. And this kind of class is called, this kind of model is called discrete choice model. Okay, DCM, discrete choice model. And discrete choice model is the traditional way that economists in economics, in applied economics, uh, people model individual choice. How do individuals m make choices, right? Okay? Cho the choice, individual choice, is just like a category or like a class. You can think about individual choice as a classification problem. So in the end, we'll see that this free choice model has a lot of connection to classification methods in statistics. All right, they are, they are, they are almost, they're basically the same thing, uh, but they have some economic, we, we, but we can give some economic meaning to this free choice model. So let's see. Uh, in this free choice models, we, uh, we model each individual how they make choice. Based on what? Based on utility maximization. So the typical economic theory says individuals have a different utility associated with different choices. And then when we make choice, we maximize our utility by choosing the best one. Right? So that's how that's the approach. So I'm going to say, okay, for each individual I, I face J choices, okay? And uh, the utility for each choice is UIJ. So U, U, I is I is the individual, J is the choice. So UIJ is your utility for each choice. And then in the end, you are going to choose one of the J, right? So from one to J, you are going to choose one. Which one? This is, is basically the arg max UIJ, right? Whatever maximizes my utility. And that's my YI. So YI is my final choice, right? So Y is, is any, any one between one to J. That's my final choice. And the YI is arg max UIJ. Okay. So that's very simple, right? This is the basic random utility framework that gave us the discrete choice models. So, uh, there are two choices. Suppose there are two choices, one, two, right? There's U1 and U2. Now, for each individual I, there's UI1, UI2. These are two choices. YI is my choice, and it's either zero, it's either one or two, okay? So my choice is either one or two, but which is it? Well depending on which one is, is larger. So yi will be equal to max ui1 and ui2. Which one is larger, I will choose that. So that's arg max. And then finally, my utility, ui, is ui is my final utility. Will just be the max of ui1 and ui2, right? Okay. Which one is larger, I choose that. That becomes my utility. This is the basic of random utility framework. Now, the discrete choice model basically amounts to different kind of model, different kind of the discrete choice model basically amounts to how do we how do we model this? What is our model for UIJ? Okay, different model give us different, you know, different types of discrete choice models. Okay? So I'm, so I'm going to say um, so we can always write UIJ. I can always write it as F. Uh, J, X, I, J, plus E, J. Okay, I can always write it this way. Do people agree? Okay, so let's think about it, right? Uh, in multi-class logistic regression, okay, in multinomial logistic regression, Y, J, probably Y, J, uh, is equal to y equal to j. Let me say, okay. Probably y equal to j is equal to uh, e to the beta j prime x, right? So we have an x, and then the coefficients beta j, uh, and then um, let me just say soft max, okay? Right. That's simpler. So it's a soft max of beta j prime x. So not a rigorous way of writing it, but you know. Okay. So, here there are two things. One is variable x. The other is the coefficient of beta j. Beta j is the coefficient associated with choice j. But I can always write this as simply a function of x, right? 
but the function of x has, but we, ha we, we, we have a different function for different j. So I'm all, I can always write this as fjx, correct? So in, in other words, I don't have to have beta j. Beta jx is a linear thing. Softmax turned it into a nonlinear thing. But I can have any function, right, okay? Any function, maybe as long as it's between zero and one, I can do it. So I can just say f is any function. And, then, and, and but, then, but then for each choice, there's a different fj. So for y equal to one, this is f1, f1x. For y equal to two, uh, this is f2x, right? Each choice, a different fjx. This is, the more, this, is the more, this is the most general way of writing this, okay? Every function has this. So what, is, what, is, what about yi? The probability yi would just be what? Would just be fj, the probability yi equal to j would just be fjx i, right? i is the characteristic associated with individual i. Now, now that we are talking about discrete choice models, I'm going to make this more general. I'm still going to have fj. So fj is the function associated with choice j. But instead of xi here, I'm going to have xij. What does it mean? It means that I'm going to have uh, variables that not only change with i, but also change with j. Do people, do people know what kind of variable will change with j? Now, remember our previous example, right? So we model uh, in multi-class, in multi-normal logic regression. We model how temperature and the rainfall affect uh, which crop people grow. Now, temperature and the rainfall are xi, because each i here is a county, is a different place, like it's a different county. Okay, so each county there's a different temperature, and there's a different uh, there's different rainfall. But it's not xij. What does it mean? What do I mean xij? It means that the x does not vary, it only varies with i. So each county has different temperature. It does not vary with j, with the choice. So in other words, what are our choice? Our choice is corn, wheat, uh, uh, rice. So the temperature and, the, and the rainfall do not vary depending on whether you are growing corn or wheat. It's always the same in each county, right? However, there are some variables that vary with j, not i. So these, are, these variables vary, vary with choice, not vary with the individual. Can you think about any variable like that? In predicting uh, transportation, we use the variable income and distance. Again, income and, income and distance are xi, okay? Because each individual has different income and different distance. It's not j, it's not xj. Do you know any variable that vary not with the individual, but vary with choice? Meaning each different choice, the x is different. But maybe it's the same for every individual. Exactly, price. Okay, so it's the most simple. You no, know, it's the most simple and universal example that in economics we all, we always do. When you choose different options, like when you choose when you buy this car or that car, what is the single most important factor? Price. And does does the price vary for each person? Sometimes, right? You know, people have this, different people have different discount and you know, coupons and no different salespeople, but. Let's just assume that everybody, uh, you know, it has the same price, but the price for different cars is obviously different. So in this case, this price P is a PJ thing. Okay, it, it probably it probably varies with I two, but it definitely varies with J. Okay, so in when we discuss discrete choice models, I'm going to be more general. I'm going to include not only X, X I, but I'm going to include X J. In fact, I'm going to give them different names, okay? I'm going to say my x i j is really consists of two things. One is called s i. So s i is what I call individual specific variables. So s i only changes with i. Example, income, okay? So income only changes with i. Right. Now, I can also say x i j includes something like z j, right? Something that varies with j. Example, price. Okay. Price varies with different choice. Now, uh, oftentimes I just give, I call it zij as well, because, you know, oftentimes price uh, changes not only with choice, but different people may have, may face different price, right? Because of variation. So, I call zij 
alternative specific uh, variables, individual specific variables. Okay, individual specific, alternative specific. Alternative means choice specific. All right, we're going to have them both. Okay, and then I'm going to say the function is xij. So the function takes xij into it, and then the function is fj. So the function maps xij into the utility for each different choice. <coughs> this is our most general framework. Right? And, and then I can make more specific. All right. Um, so based on this framework, what is, the, what is the probability that any individual, yi, will choose uh, j? Okay. j, again, is 1, 2, 3. What is the probability of y which was using this using this model? Right, this is not some, you know, this is a general framework. But using this framework, what is the probability of y y which was j? Now, here we assume that x i j are our observed variables. These are variables that we see. E j is the variable that, so I should say e i j. Okay, so e i j is the things that, that we do not see. It's a it's a random. Uh, you can think about it as as random noise, right? Okay, so. Based on this framework, I can calculate the probability of y equal to j, which is what? So when y equal to j, that must mean that, uh, that fj xij okay, is plus ej, which is the utility of choosing choice j, is larger than fk xi k plus e i k for all k, right? Correct? Okay, so basically, you know, it's larger than, if it's j is equal to 1, that has to be, it has larger than the utility for 2 and 3 and 5 in order for people to choose this j. Okay, so it's larger than everything else, okay? Now, uh, let's suppose, let me, let's simplify things. Let me suppose there are only, only j and a k, only two choices. These two choices are called j and a k. So one or two, okay? So then, in order for people to choose J, this thing, this utility for J has to be larger than the utility of K. But what is that? So I can say the probability is equal to the probability that utility J is larger than utility K. But the probability J larger than K is simply the, prob I, can, I can write it this way. So let's say EIJ, uh, EIJ, uh, okay, minus, uh, EIK. Actually, let's do it the other way. Let's say EIK minus EIJ will be smaller than FK XI uh, K minus FK XIJ. Right? Okay. That's simple math. Now, this part we already know. Because these are absurd variable, right? This is our random. This is our random noise. This is our e. So how can so can I calculate based on this? Can I calculate the probability of y equal to j from from here? Can I can I basically can I calculate this probability? This probability is um, is what? Let's say let's say e i k minus eij, right? Which is this part, okay? Let's suppose this variable, let me call it delta e, because, because it's the difference between two e. Now, suppose delta e has a distribution of f. f is distribution of delta e. Then this probability is simply equal to what? So f is the CDF, okay? The cumulative CDF of delta e. Then, what it, then how do I write this? Do people know? It's simply what? It's simply f, this thing, right? Okay, fk xi xik minus fj xij. Correct? Okay. This is simply the CDF, okay, of the delta e. So in other words, in other words, my point here is really simple. Once you specify this, once we specify a distribution for e, we can calculate all these probabilities. Now, in other words, in other words, once we specify a distribution, then we will be able to estimate this function f. <coughs> so, different discrete choice model 
are essentially different specification of this f. Because this f is the distribution that you give to E, right? And you can specify this f. You can specify this f to be, for example, normal distribution or some other kind of distribution. If you give different distribution to this E, that gives you different kind of models for discrete choice models. But the underlying principle is the same, so which is which is based on this is based on a, a specification of, of the distribution. We can always calculate this e, uh, this probability of y equal to j, and based on that, we can estimate the functional form. And, okay, so I will see examples, right? And this probability, by the way, it's called a choice probability, but oftentimes it's called the conditional choice probability because we actually condition on x, right? So it's the conditional probability of choosing y. Uh, in econometrics and statistics, it's sometimes called CCP, conditional choice probability, which is very important. So once we can, we can, you can calculate the CCP, you can estimate the function f. Okay. All right. So let's talk about how do we write the function f. What is, how do we specify this function? The simplest way of specifying this function, remember we need to have a different function for each j, okay, for each choice. The simplest way to specify this function is very, very simple. Make it a linear function, right? Make it a linear model. So the linear model, again, is the simplest model we have, right? One of the simplest. Okay, just say beta j prime x i j, okay? That's it. So this is the simplest linear function, right? Plus e i j, right? So if I do that, that's a linear model, right? Linear discrete choice model, where the utility is equal to beta prime, you know, times this xij plus ej. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about some additional feature of this util uh, of this utility function. Sorry, of this random utility framework. The first thing we should, uh, once we specify a uh, utility framework, right? Random utility framework. Suppose I have two choice, choice one and two. Then I can say, okay, y, ui1 is equal to um, the, uh, let's say, beta i1 prime xij, uh, xi1 plus ei1, and ui2 is equal to beta i2 xi2 plus ei2, the first thing we should notice is that I can always, right, I can always add a constant c to each utility. People clear about that? I can add c here, I can add c here. My model is exactly the same. Why? Because in the end, I only care about what? I only care about which one is larger, right? So y is, y is argmax, is which one is larger, okay? Is ui1 larger or ui2 larger? So I don't care, I don't care about their absolute level, okay? The level, I don't care. I don't care about utility level. I can have a c to each utility. I get the same prediction. So level is not important. What is important is the difference between them, right? What is important is which one is larger. So I care about the difference between ui1 and ui2, UI2 okay? The difference, I care. I don't care about the level. So anytime you have a constant, you can minus from both level and you get exactly the same result, okay? Right, so let's take a look at you know, these two examples, right? I have two, now, now I have two choice for A and B, okay? Um, so the model one is ui is equal to mu a plus eia. And the EIA is a normal, you know, uh, random variable. And the UIB is mu B plus EIB, and a normal variable. I would say that this model is exactly equivalent to this model. In this model, UIA is equal to zero. And UIB is equal to mu B minus mu A, and the EIB minus EIA, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm simply minus, this, taking away the, the entire UIA, and then let UIB minus UI. These two models are exactly the same. Right? People agree? Because level is unimportant. I can add or plus I can add plus or minus anything, 
and the model remain the same. Because why? Because the difference is exactly the same, so it give me the same prediction. All right, so level do not matter. And you have already seen this, right? In, in binary logic regression, we always make the first level, we always make one level reference level. And by making reference level, we're essentially making them equal to zero. So that the other levels are always with respect to them. The reason why we do this is exactly here, right? You add or minus any constant, it's the same choice. So it's the same choice problem, okay? So you cannot, in other words, there's, you know, if, 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 in other words, there's no way for you to separately identify the levels of both. The only thing you can identify is the difference between them. So that's the first thing we should know uh, in, in utility models, okay? Now, um, the second point you should know is that scale is also irrelevant. What do we mean by scale? If, um, if I have these two models, it's probably still easier to write in F, in, in F terms. But you know, if I have F1, Xi1, plus Ei1, and then I have F2, Xi2, plus Ei2, OK? Now, I can always do what? I can always time lambda. So times lambda, times lambda, right? Times lambda each. Lambda can be any constant, OK? As long as it's not, uh, let's say, any positive constant. Okay? So lambda larger than 0. If I do this, then they are, again, the same model. People agree? Because, again, I only care about which one is larger. So we can times 100 here, times 100 here. Doesn't matter. A same model. So that means scale, okay, scale is also irrelevant. So for any choice model, you can plus 100 here on both choices. It's the same model. Or you can times 100 to both, to both choices. It's the same model. Okay? Scale doesn't matter. Uh, uh, level doesn't matter. Let's again take a look at this model, right? So, um, let's say, what about I do this, all right? Um, suppose I go back to, okay, go back to this one, right? So model one. Model one, let's, let's see, this EIA, this error, is a normal random variable with a standard deviation uh, with a variance uh, sigma a squared. Here the variance is sigma b squared. I can what? I can do what? I can divide each model by the standard deviation of, of both. Right? So I can so I can do this, okay? I can let I can divide each model by the sigma square a plus sigma b square b. Can I do that? Okay. So in other words, I have mu a mu a plus uh, e a, e i a, and I have mu b plus e i b. Now, e i a is a normal zero sigma square a, and e i b is a normal zero sigma square b. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply lambda here, lambda, right? I'm going to multiply lambda everywhere, but the lambda is equal to one over square root of sigma square a, plus sigma square b. This is my lambda. It's very simple, right? I can multiply this to each one. The result will be the variance of this error becomes sigma a squared divided by the sum of this one. OK? It's very simple. Right? So this is just an example, right? Just show you that, look, you can do this. And the result is exactly the same model. OK? All right. So finally, what can I do? I can do this, OK? Finally, because remember, we're going from model one. I'm going to transform model one in two steps. The first step is I'm going to do model two. So from model one to model two, I'm basically, diff I'm basically minus the same constant. So that model one becomes UIA becomes 0, and UIB becomes this. Okay? That's the first step. I think I should still write it. Okay, so uh, mu a plus e a mu b plus e i b. All right. What is the first step? The first step is I let this be zero. This be zero, and this becomes u b minus u a mu a plus u b 
plus EIB minus minus EI EI A. Okay. So this is the, this is our first step. Now the second step I can do more, which is look at this random variable. What is EIB minus EIA? EIA EIB are both normal random variable. So the sum of two normal random variables is still a normal random variable, right? So EIA EIB is a normal random variable with zero mean. Do people know what's the variance? Suppose they're independent, right? They're previously independent, then it's sigma square A plus sigma square B, okay? So the second step of what I'm going to do, the second step is I'm going to times lambda here, and I'm going to times lambda here. What is the lambda I'm going to time? I'm going to let lambda equal to one over square root of sigma A plus square root of sigma B. Once I time this lambda, what is the what is the resulting? Let me let me just say e tilde, okay? So let e tilde equal to lambda e i b minus e i a. What is the distribution of e tilde? It's normal zero one, right? Okay, so it's standard normal distribution. So basically, I'm doing two steps. The first step, I make one of the level become zero. So I set one of the level to be the reference level, okay? Minus the constant, one of the level becomes zero. The second step is I make the standard deviation of the random error to be one. I turn it into a normal zero one. I can do these two steps, right? Okay, so finally, our final result is this model, where ui is equal to zero and the uib is this thing, okay? There's a constant plus an error term, and the error term has a normal zero one distribution. I can do these two steps because number one, level is uh, important. Number two, scale is relevant. So both level and scale, I can minus a level and can times a constant. So I can always make one of the level to be zero, and I, and I can make this you know one of the error term. So I can make the error term have standard deviation equal to one. Okay, so that's that's a normalization that I can do. Okay. All right. So in the end, how many? Let's let's come let's come back again to this normal right to this where we start. We start from this simple model. How many parameters do I have? Mu a is unknown parameter. Mu b is unknown parameter. Sigma a is unknown. Sigma b is unknown. So I have one, two, three, four. I have four unknown parameters. And I have a bunch of data. Right? The data is uh, data is choice people choice. So can you tell me? Can I estimate these four, four pa parameters? Can I estimate these four parameters? Uh, if, you know, just looking at this model. Is there any way to estimate mu a, mu b, sigma a, sigma b? There's no way. Why there's no way? Because this model is equivalent to our final model like this, okay? So the model one is equivalent to model four. In model four, how many parameters do I have? How many? Well. This random error only has normal zero one, right? We know it's zero one, so there's nothing to estimate. The only unknown parameter is this thing, okay? Is this mu b, transforming the mu b. So now we only have one parameter, which indicates what? Which indicates in the original model, model one, there's no way to estimate four parameters because the whole model only has one free parameter to estimate, which is this one, okay? So you can, that's the most you can do is this is this parameter? There's no way to estimate for. Now think about what this what this parameter is actually saying, right? This parameter indicates the utility difference between a and a b, but normalized so that this random error has standard deviation one. Okay, so so that's a right. So it's like this. Um, we're going to say we're setting we're first setting one of the level to be zero, and then we're going to say our error term has standard deviation one. So this is the original e. We're making it to be standard deviation one, and then we estimate the probability that people will end up choosing, uh, you know, something that. So so this one choice is just zero. The other choice is above zero. So we end up estimating the probability, like the total area under this curve. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, so I hope the, I hope the discussion uh, uh, makes sense. Right. 
so uh, again, let, let me let me let me rephrase it one more way, right? So you have choice and a B. In reality, you observe people choosing either A or choosing B. What you can estimate from a simple model, right? The previous model in, in terms of mu A, mu B, we only have we only have a constant. In this model A, we only have a constant mu A and mu B, which is the mean utility for each choice. The problem is, can you estimate the mean utility? Well, the, the answer is no. You cannot estimate the mean utility for each choice. You can only estimate the difference in mean utility. When you see people choosing A or choosing B, you can only estimate the difference in the utility of A versus utility of B. But also, uh, you can say, suppose you see people always choosing A. You can say, okay, the utility of A is higher than B. But can you ask, but what is the, what is the difference? Well, you can say the difference is 100, or the difference is 1, or the difference is 10,000. Right? You can say anything, because, you know, because as long as B is larger than 1, people is going to choose B. B is larger than A, people is going to B. So you, got, you have to fix the scale. Okay? So or, you, know, you can think about, the other way to think about it is you can say, okay, choice B, the difference between choice and choice, the, the difference between the utility of choice A and the utility of choice B is, for example, $10. Okay. But if you change it from dollar to RMB, you can say the difference is you know, 70 RMB. So is it, is it 10 or is it 70? Which one is it? The answer is it doesn't matter, but you're gonna fix a unit. So what are we doing when, we, when, we're, when, we're, transform, when we're fixing the scale to normal zero one, we're exactly fixing the, the scale, we're fixing the unit, you can think about that way. So once we fix the unit so that the error term has variance one, then we can say, okay, now the difference between them by is, for example, 10. And you know what the unit for this 10 is, right? because it's already stand, scaled in terms of one thing, right? fixed, uh, fixed in terms of one thing. So that's basically the spirit behind them. All right, okay. So uh, now we are ready to, once we have this uh, sort of prep step, we're ready to introduce uh, our first uh, model, okay? First discrete choice model. Now, discrete choice model is anything that has this random utility framework, right? And different discrete choice, different discrete choice model are essentially different models that, that give different essentially models that give different specification to the distribution of the error term. The first model we're going to do is to introduce is called a probing model. The probing model is basically this discrete choice model, which which says the error term has a joint normal distribution. So once we say the error, the e, is a joint normal, it's a probing model. All right, uh, it's very simple. Okay. Uh, let's say example. The example, suppose we have two choices, A and B, binary. In binary case, we say UIA is equal to XIA prime uh, beta A, right? Plus EIA, X, UIB, uh, XIB, beta B plus EIB. Simple, okay? It's a linear model, and uh, if we assume that EIA and EIB are jointly normal, in the sense that they have a, there is a correlation between EIA and EIB, right? So they're joint normal. So this is the covariance between A and B. Uh, this is sigma is the variance of EIA and then this variance of EIB. So if they are joint to normal, that's called a probing model. It's, it's really simple, okay? All right. Now, just like I said before, if I give you this model, it's not the final one you should use. We have to do some surgery to it. What should I do? We need to, norm we do, we need to normalize this model. First of all, uh, I need to do what? I need to make one of them zero. Okay. Just make one of them reference level. So let's let's make UIA zero. I can always do that, right? Okay. So let's make UIA equal to zero. Then we have U XIB uh, beta B minus XIA beta A uh, plus the difference between E. What is the difference between E? The difference between E is this normal distribution, okay? Which is a normal zero, sigma A squared plus sigma squared minus two sigma A B. Uh, do people see that, right? Because now it's not in, they're not independent now, okay, right? The, the two E's are not independent. There's a, there's a covariance, there's a correlation. So once you have EIA, EIA minus EIB, the distribution is the normal distribution with variance that's actually, you know, the variance of A plus minus B minus the covariance. So my second step is to divide this model, like divide this UIB by what? by the standard deviation of this, okay? In order to make the final EIB, will has a, in order to make the final EIB a normal zero one. Everybody follow me? I can always make the final EIB normal zero one. 
because I can always normalize the scale. So the first step is always normalize the level, make one level zero. The second step is I, I, I would divide a constant in order to make this E normal zero one. All right, so more example, all right? So, uh, so it's, a bit, it's, a, it's a little bit abstract, and uh, there's a, uh, and I would say it's, it's probably not the most fun thing to go over this, all these examples, but uh, uh, we need to go through them to fully understand uh, how the discrete choice model work. So now let's see, there, there are two choices, A and B. Let's follow me a bit. Suppose I say UIA is equal to alpha A times ZA sigma A plus EIA. And UIB is alpha B plus ZB sigma B EIB. Okay. The first thing to notice is here Z is what kind of variable is Z. Now pay close attention to whether there's an I or whether there's no I, whether there's an A or whether there's no A. So EIA is a random, random variable, random noise that changes with both I and A. Now I is individual, A is choice. Alpha A is a constant that only changes with choice, does not change with the individual. ZA is what? ZA is a variable that only change with choice and do not change with the individual, right? So ZA is what we call alternative specific variable. It's not, it's not individual specific, it's only alternative specific. Okay, so um, the, uh, can we estimate this model? That's my question. Can we estimate sigma b and sigma i? So z a, z and z b are what we observe. The parameters here are alpha a, alpha b, sigma a, sigma b. Can I estimate sigma? Now, of course, I know we, we know that we need to do some surgery, right? We need to make one of them zero, and we need to normalize the scale, normalize the level. But uh, even after normalizing the scale level, there is actually no way to estimate a sigma, an alpha actually, no way to estimate. Do you know why? So I have alpha A plus Z A, uh, let's say delta A, alpha B plus Z B delta B. I will just omit the error term. This model cannot be estimated. And there's a reason why is because Z A delta A is just like alpha A. They are both a. They are both not. They both do not vary with the individual. They're not. They're both not function of i. They're only function of a, right? So from the perspective of individual. So if we go, you know, if we vary according to, so if we go from individual one to individual n, this is a constant, and this is also a constant. Is there any way to separate the two constant? No way. Okay. No way. So it's impossible to estimate because it's impossible to know if there's any difference between alpha A and delta A, right? I can always, I can always add 100 to alpha A and a minus, minus 100 divided by ZA to delta A and it will always give me the same thing, model. So there's no way to estimate this because they're both constant. In other words, how do I, so how do I estimate this model? Like how do I make this model estimatable? Okay. Now, in order to for this model, suppose I have alpha and the delta a, okay, fixed. In order for this model to to be estimatable, this z a has to what? Has to change with i, right? That's it. it. Has to change with i. So it has to be different for each i, in order for this model to be estimatable. So the lesson here is, lesson here is the alternative specific variable like z i j must vary with i in order to be what? In order for the model to be identified. Identified means we can actually estimate the parameters. But there's a trick here, which says as long as there is an intercept term, okay? Meaning as long as there, are, there is this term, alpha and alpha b. If there's no alpha a, alpha b, if our model is simply z a delta a, the z b delta b, can we estimate? Yes, like yes. The problem here is because there's alpha a, okay? All right, so as long as there's an intercept term, your alternative specific variable has to vary with i, 
in order to be identified. Okay. Now, let's be a little more concrete, right? What this, what this, what, you know, what our current discussion says is that you cannot estimate this model. You cannot estimate UI Honda, okay? UI Honda, you know, whether this person would choose Honda or Toyota. You cannot say UI Honda is equal to, uh, let's say, uh, beta zero plus beta one P Honda, okay, plus E. And this is, this is, you know, beta, some other thing, you know, alpha zero plus alpha one P Toyota, okay, plus E. This model will never be able to estimate because this price is alternative specific and does not vary with I. So this price does not, does not change with individual. And this is a constant, so this is a constant, this is a constant. There's no way to do it. Now, if you delete a constant, okay, if you do this, yeah, yeah, you can do that. All right, so, so that's, a, that's a lesson here. All right, uh, example two. Now let's look at uh, another case where ui is equal to alpha a, again a constant, plus now si prime gamma plus ea. So si here is an individual specific variable, like income. Okay, so are we able to estimate this gamma? Can we estimate this gamma? That's the question. Is it possible? Can I say UI Honda, <laughs> right? So UI Honda is equal to beta zero plus uh, beta one income. Okay. Income is my, you know, income, and, and this is equal to alpha zero plus alpha one income. I, I, right? Because income changes with different individual. Am I able to estimate this, this parameter? Well, actually, no, actually, I'm sorry. I should say beta, okay? It's all beta here. It's beta here, beta here. Okay. It's impossible to estimate, okay? The reason why it's impossible to estimate is because look, this is beta, beta income i, same beta, right? Same beta. Same beta, you use it to explain people's choice of Honda versus Toyota. Is it possible? No. Because the income is the same for Honda or Toyota, right? Your income doesn't change. And the same income, and the same beta. How can you how can you use this combination to help you predict whether people will choose Honda or Toyota? There's no way, because beta income is the same thing, right? So in other words, now if we look at the mathematics, basically remember we can always minus a constant. We can always normalize UI to zero. If I normalize UI to zero, what does what does UIB become? UIB becomes alpha b minus alpha a plus EIB minus EIB. Yeah, this whole SI gamma thing goes away because they're exactly the same. So this model is equivalent to this model, and there's no SI. In other words, it's impossible to estimate. So what is the lesson here? The lesson here is if you have an individual specific variable like income, the gamma, the variable, the, the parameter, has to change with what? With choice. Okay. So it has to be beta A here and a beta B here. So beta Honda, beta Toyota. If you, because income is individual specific, the parameter has to change with choice. You have to have a different parameter. Otherwise the model is not, cannot be estimated. You have already seen this, right? Remember in logistic regression, what, what is the logistic regression? Okay. Think about logistic regression. The logistic regression model is we have an X, and this X is typically an individual specific variable, not alternative specific. You want to predict YI? The model is probably yi equal to one, my right? binary is equal to e to the beta, well actually actually let's say y equal to j, okay? We have multi-class. For multi-class, probably yi equal to j is e to the beta j prime xi, right? J prime, divided by the sum of e to the beta k prime xi, okay? So why do we have beta j? So in other words, why do we have a different beta for different choice? Because if you have the same beta, then this whole model becomes meaningless. It's impossible to estimate. So in other words, if you, whenever you have an individual specific variable, your parameter has to change with the alternative. Okay. All right. Uh, what, what else do we have? All right. So example three, now, uh, now it's possible, okay? So now we have ui is equal to alpha a plus si prime gamma a, ui b is alpha b times x five prime gamma b. Now in this case, gamma actually varies with alternative, so they are able to be, we're able to estimate them. However, okay, 
However, it's impossible to separately uh, uh, sort of estimate alpha A, alpha B, gamma A, gamma B. So we can estimate gamma, but we can only estimate what? We can only estimate the difference between gamma A and gamma B. Why? Because again, what I can do, I can difference them, right? I can take this to be zero and minus them. Only the difference matters. So, right, so we, can always, we should always bear that in mind. Okay, so let's do normalization, right? Now, uh, start with this model, model three. Start with this. What I'm going to do, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make the first level zero, normalize the level. So that gave us this model, okay? Right? Delta alpha A plus SI delta gamma B. And then the second step is I'm going to normalize the scale so that this delta EIB becomes a normal zero one, right? Divide everything by lambda. So this is my final model, okay? All right. Okay, now there's something a little more complicated, all right? Now we have uh, alpha A plus SI is individual specific variable times a, a parameter that is, that is alternative specific plus ZIA, ZIA is alternative specific variable that varies with both I and J times uh, 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 this lambda, right, okay, times ZIA. All right, and we can also do this. So instead of this, uh, uh, this is delta, I'm sorry. This gamma, this delta, lambda, lambda. So we can either lambda, we can also do lambda A, lambda B. So in other words, if I was Z, if the Z is varies with both the individual and the, and, and the choice, if the Z is both individual specific and alternative specific, then we don't care the parameter. The parameter can just be a constant. Or the parameter can vary with choice. They're both legitimate, okay? The both, model, both models work. So the parameter can be this delta or delta A, delta B. It's all fine, all right? Uh, there's a name for it. We say if the parameter delta do not change with, with choice, we say it's generic coefficients. If it changes with the choice, we say it's alternative specific coefficients. Right. A bunch of names. All right. Okay, so let's see. Uh, let's try some uh, simulations. And I'll, because we don't have much time left, let me... Uh, let me go through some simulations, then we're done. All right. The first simulation for probe it. UI is equal to 5 minus 10, 10 SI. Uh, UIB is minus 5 plus 10 SI. Okay. SI is, you know, just some variable that changes with I. I'm going to assume that my error term, EIA, EIB, is this joint normal distribution with mean 1 and minus 1, and the variance is this. Now, what does this mean? It means that these two errors are independent. And uh, unfortunately, their mean is not zero, okay? But, okay, so what can I, what, what, starting from this model, if I use my probit model to estimate this, can I get five minus five minus 10, 10? No, that's not going to be the parameter that I get. What do I get? Well, I get the normalized version. So if I, I need to normalize this first, I need to make UI equal to zero. So UIB minus UI is here. And then I need to divide by square root of five. Why square root of five? Because y sine divided by square root of 5, my EIB has a normal 0 1. So in the end, my model is this one. Okay, After all the surgeries, my model is UI equal to 0, UIB is equal to this thing, which is minus 5.37 plus 8.94, you know, uh, this model. So let's try, okay? Let's do our estimation. Now in R, uh, you know, so this is how I do simulation, right? Minus 5 plus 10 plus E1, E2. And... Uh, Let's skip this, skip this, okay? So this uh, this is how we do probing, right? It's very simple. We're still using GLM, the generalized linear model function. And now we have Y as a function of S. But now I'm going to say the family is equal to probing, okay? Binomial link equal to probing. It's a bit long, right? Uh, but that's how we do probing uh, regression uh, in R. And uh, this is our estimate. So the estimate is intercept is minus 5.4 and beta is 9.07. So minus five and nine. What are these numbers? Remember, the original model is here, okay? But clearly, we're not getting this one. Instead, we're getting this one, okay? Minus five and nine. So the end of you, the, the final result, what you're estimating is this normalized version, okay? Normalized scale, normalized value, uh, uh, level, and you get, this, you get this model, and that's what your estimate is. Simulation two, 
UI UI B. I get this, I get, you know, same same kind of thing. Mi minus five five minus ten minus five plus ten. But now um, the error term is the error term are correlated. They have covariance. Okay, they are correlated. Uh, but that's the same thing. Okay, we're doing. So I'm doing the same procedure. Standardize, you know, normalize the scale, normalize the level. I end up with this model. Now I, now I, instead of divide, divided by square root of five, I divide by square root of three, because once you have the co covariance, you know, it's, it changes things a bit, right? But now finally I get minus seven, minus six point nine three plus eleven point five five. So let's again do the same thing, okay? Um, so this is some simulation, and then uh, do the probe it. And once you do the probe, we get minus seven and eleven point nine six, which is okay. Which is minus seven eleven point six six, which is essentially how this model. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. Uh, simulation three. Now, what's the difference here? Well, look. Uh, instead of SI, I also have ZIA and the ZIB. So Z is a individual specific and alternative specific variable. Uh, and its, it's common variable is point, its common parameter is point zero 0.01. Again, I make all the, I do all the surgery and the final result is here, okay? So, how do I do this one in the, uh, how do I do this model in, in probe using R, right? In, how do I do it into probe? One way to do is now because we have, so I'm going to say, okay, U1 is a function of S and a Z1. U2 is a function of S and a Z2. So Z, Z1 and Z2 are like Z I A Z I B, right? So one thing to do is I can simply regress y on S and Z1 and Z2. So I basically put ZIA and ZIB in the same regression function. Why? Because look, in the end, my UIB is this function of SI and this function of ZIA and ZIB. Okay? It's a function of all three of them. So I can put all three of them on the right-hand side and do the probe. The result, look, here, the one thing is the ZI and the ZIB both have 0 0.045. Both have this kind of variable, parameter. Okay? So once I do the probe it, what do I get? I basically get the same thing. Okay? I get one, one parameter 0 0.044, the other is minus 0 0.046. So I get the correct answer. Of course, you can also do this. You can also define DZ is equal to ZI, Z2 minus Z1, which is ZIB minus ZIA. And then you put DZ here. Right? And the, the result is minus 0 0.045. That's exactly what we have here. Okay, that's exactly what we have. So, you know, so this is our, these are just simulations to show you how probe works. Now, if you're curious, uh, the way that probe estimation go is exactly the same way uh, that the logistic regression is done, which is by maximizing likelihood. Okay, so for for uh, for logistic regression. We can calculate we calculate the probability y y equal to a certain value condition on x, and then we use it to construct the likelihood function, and then we maximize the likelihood function to get us beta. Probe it, same thing. Given each probe model, okay. given each probe model like this, we can calculate the probability that people make each choice, the CCP, the conditional choice probability, and uh, based on the assumption that E is normal distribution. Okay? Because E is normally distributed, based on this assumption, we can calculate the CCP, the choice probability. And then based on the choice probability, we can construct the likelihood and the maximizing. And after maximizing the likelihood, uh, you get all the betas. Right? So I just show you how, how you can do this automatically in R. But you should understand the underlying way mechanism of doing this is constructing the likelihood based on the assumption that E is normally distributed and then maximizing it. Okay? So MLE is the way to go. All right, uh, so that's it for today. And next class, when, what I'm going to do is uh, what I'm, go I'm going to assume that E is not normally distributed, that E is some other kind of distribution, which will give you a, comp a different kind of model. And that model is also interesting, okay? In this, especially because we have already covered it. Uh, so we discuss it next time, all right? Okay. <laughs>